Good. So welcome everybody to um, today's IMP One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, uh, Hermann Schulz-Baldes from Erlangen. And uh, Hermann will tell us about the pseudogaps of random hopping models, uh, analysis of critical energies. Hermann, we are very much looking forward for your talk. So thank you very much uh, for including me. Thank you for uh, listening, those who, who made it right now. So I gave this talk a couple of um, months ago, I think, uh, pseudo gaps of random hopping models, because I thought, okay, that would be something of interest to uh, what's all, maybe also uh, the physics oriented people in the audience. And uh, then while preparing the talks in the, la the talk in the last days, I um, noted that it might be good to extend a bit uh, the perspective on the whole thing. So uh, actually the whole talk is now about what I call uh, critical energies and the analysis. So these are particular energies which appear in um, random uh, one-dimensional systems, uh, strictly one-dimensional systems. Um, however, um, so these, um, how to say, I mean, these energies also appear in, in quasi one dimensional situations, but I'm not going to talk about that. So uh, the paper, there's a recent paper, which I just put on the archive this week, which was written with Christian Sadl and Joris de Moor. Most of the rest of the talk was work with Florian Dorsch, but there were also some earlier contributors like uh, Svetlana, uh, Werner and Günther and Maxim, uh, who developed the concept of uh, critical energies with me. So here's uh, the overview. Uh, I start out with something very concrete, uh, namely this random hopping model. And well, I tell you what is in the title, namely the, what are these pseudo gaps. Uh, but there's something else interesting happening, which are logarithmic singularities in the density of states. So I'll try to illustrate that to you also with some numerics and uh, go on to uh, state uh, the main result that we have on that and then the main part of the talk is about explaining where that comes from. So that allows me to go through transfer matrices and proof of variables. We'll tell you what these critical energies are and there's quite some probability theory then going into proving the main results. So this is a very particular model maybe for, for you when you see that first, uh, but uh, the second part of the talk, then I will try to explain why this model is particularly interesting for what I call, or many people call, topological phase transitions in um, quasi one dimensional models. Um, so I'll tell you what type of phase I'm talking about and okay, explain also why I think that this notion of topological phase transition is actually adequate. Um, so that uh, is possible because we can work with so called reduced transfer matrices in these. Uh, quasi one dimensional situations. But when you do that, you get again to the same kind of a problem as in the random hopping model. And okay, so this is about critical energies which are hyperbolic up to here. Uh, then there are two other type of uh, critical energies, namely elliptic ones and parabolic ones, which have been studied already a couple of years ago. But we have some new elements to the theory of uh, elliptic critical energies, which I would actually like to present then in the last part if I had some time. So um, here's the random hopping model. So a one-dimensional discrete random Schrodinger operator. So X on L2 of Z. And you see it's the next nearest neighbor hopping with the hopping coefficients here, T, N, which are um, random numbers. And uh, let's suppose that they're independent uh, and uh, independent random variables, which are positive. If they have their complex numbers, uh, it's uh, not a problem. You can gauge the phases away, actually. And to make things a bit more simple, uh, suppose that the distribution of these uh, random variables is compact. So it doesn't touch zero and it doesn't go up to infinity. So mainly, we have to distinguish two cases, as I'll explain, namely one, where not all distributions are uh, the same. So a uh, typical situation would be that the even and the odd distributions have different, uh, are, are different, such that, well, on the even uh, sides, you have an expectation of the logarithm of these hopping coefficients, which is different from the from the expectation of the logarithm on the odd sides, okay? 
So these are sort of random dimers. I will call that a random hopping dimer model. And uh, in these models, as you will see, we have pseudogaps. And then there are the second situation, which may seem more natural from the beginning, namely that all these TNs, they are identically distributed. Then of course you don't have, I mean, then you obviously have equality here. And I call this situation the balanced situation. Huh? Uh, so that's a balanced random hopping model. So as a start, uh, what should be noted about this very simple elementary model is that it has a bipartite symmetry. Namely, if you look for, you look at the symmetry operator, which on uh, the sides of the lattice designed, uh, I mean, designated by the N here, uh, just uh, adds a sign alternatively. Uh, then the Hamiltonian with this symmetry operator, this self-adjoint uh, unitary operator here, anti-commutes, okay? So this is a bipartite symmetry. And of course, that means that the spectrum has an, uh, a reflection symmetry at zero. And that also means that the center of band is a special energy. Okay, and you will see that in the pictures in a second. So pictures meaning means that we will now look at uh, density of states. So the density of states is that you just take the number of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian uh, restricted to a finite box of size n. Uh, that's this thing here. You count those which have energy less than E. Uh, so counting is the sign here, and then you divide by n, and then this is a well-known uh, fact that as n goes to infinity, this converges almost surely to a quantity which is called the integrated density of states. So obviously that's a function which increases in the energy here. And um, well, uh, due to the normalization, uh, it, uh, it actually is the Steeltjes function of a probability measure which is then often called the density of states. Well, the density of states is the derivative if it exists. Uh, I don't actually claim that and we don't need that. So one can nicely compute this density of states quite easily by just taking uh, uh, a system, putting it on a computer and then just count the number of states. So that's the plot down here. So I did this here for the random hopping dimer model. So where the unbalanced, the, in the unbalanced situation, we just take uh, a system which is of length uh, 10,000 roughly, and uh, well, you plot where are the states, and this is what you find. So in particular, what you see is there's a nice symmetry between left and right. That was the bipartite symmetry. And the other thing that you see is that there is a hole here in the middle, okay? So this is what I call a pseudo gap. Actually, if you look more closely down there, you will find some states, but there are very few states, okay? Uh, actually, it's possible to go ahead and compute the density of states down here um, more precisely by a different technique. Namely, uh, I will explain later how this is done by the technique of the rotation number. And then if you go down and look at the um, integrated density of states relative to the center here, where it's one half, yeah, you see that it's this blue curve here, which increases extremely slowly. And actually, there's a Holder exponent involved here. The Holder exponent is in this example here, 9.5 roughly. Uh, so it's a very, very, very slow increase of the density of states. So there are very, very few states here. On the other hand side, there's a second player in this whole game, which is the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, that's the red curve. The Lyapunov exponent, well, does depend on energy, but not really very interesting, uh, shocking behavior. In particular, it is positive throughout this whole gap here, okay? So these are two facts, numerical facts. And let's go to the balanced hopping, uh, random hopping model. So here the system was a bit bigger, well, 16,000 16, uh, length. You plot the density of states. And what you see is that in the middle, there's no hole anymore. Well, moreover, if you look a bit more closely, there's actually some kind of a spike. And uh, if you blow up this inner part here, I mean, here the spike is not very distinct yet, but if you blow it up a little bit uh, and you make the histogram on a smaller scale, you see that there must be quite a few states at the center of the band. Uh, and once again, one can go ahead and uh, compute this density of states um, with a different technique, this rotation number calculation, if you do that and you plot it on the logarithmic scale, actually on the log-log scale here, so here's the energy axis, 
and uh, or I mean energy uh, distance epsilon to the center of band, which is EC here. Yeah. So it uh, it's a logarithmic scale in this epsilon here, and there's a logarithmic scale also for the increase of the integrated density of states, and you get this curve. If you go into a usual plot, I mean, corresponding just to, I mean, you just plot without the logarithms, you find a very, very uh, sharp increase here of the derivative of the density of states. Uh, so there are many, many states here. Uh, well, there is a logarithmic singularity, as I will tell you in a second. At the same time, the Lyapunov exponent has a similar behavior. Okay, it also has a very rapid increase here. I mean, it seems to go to zero, but then it increases very, very rapidly in the neighborhood around that. Uh, so in the log log plot, uh, the Lyapunov exponent has a similar behavior. Okay, so, uh, well, these are numerical facts. That's actually where the work started. And we started thinking about uh, why, uh, why is this uh, true? So here are then the mathematical results that we were able to obtain. So the first thing is for this unbalanced situation, the, um, so these hopping dimers. So for these hopping dimers, um, let's suppose you're in the case where the expectation of the logarithm of this quotient of the two neighboring sites here is positive, okay? If it's negative, everything has to be turned around. So that's uh, not a real restriction. Um, then it's possible to find a, a critical exponent a new unique exponent nu positive such that, well, this equation here holds. Yeah? That's just by convexity of the curve here. And once you've computed that, you can prove that the density of states around this critical energy, EC, which in our case here is simply zero, yeah? um, well, behaves as epsilon to the power nu with an upper and a lower bound, which is uni I mean, uniform. Uh, in, in epsilon for epsilon sufficiently small. Okay, so this explains why the uh, why you have this pseudo gap, and moreover, it gives you a technique to compute these exponents. And furthermore, you can produce really very deep pseudo gaps by just making the distributions of the even and odd sides quite distinct and different. Yeah. Okay, so that's the one situation. For the balanced hopping model, uh, we can prove that there is a logarithmic divergence. Namely, that's even more precise. You take the density of states. So here it should be EC plus epsilon yeah, minus uh, the density, integrate density at the critical energy uh, minus, well, a term which is here the variance of the logarithm of T0. Uh, so uh, that's the coefficient which goes in here. And then there is this logarithm of epsilon to the power minus two and up to errors, well, which are of lower orders. So this one here uh, gives you a very precise form of the density of states. So I would like to try to explain where that comes from. And as I already said in the introduction, this uh, works by the uh, using transfer matrices. Uh, so most of you know that the Schrodinger equation for these uh, systems, uh, I mean, this next nearest, uh, the nearest uh, neighbor um, Hamiltonians, one particle Hamiltonians can be written by uh, using the fundamental solutions, which are just given by transfer matrices. So you write out uh, that the solution at site uh, n plus one and n can be written, can be computed in terms of the two prior ones, by multiplication of a matrix, and that's the way that it looks. So uh, the first equation, so, so the second line in this equation here is completely trivial, as you see, if you multiply it out, and the first equation is just uh, the Schrodinger equation. So what is important is that uh, here it's quite natural to look at the, the two-step uh, transfer matrix, namely to take the dimers together. Well, that just means you multiply two of these matrices, and here's the algebra, what you get. You get one term which is independent of the energy, and then you get perturbations by the energy. Okay, so for energy equal to zero, there's only this first term, and what you find is there's just two coefficients. Well, it's an SL2 on SL2R always these transfer matrices, so one coefficient is the inverse of the other, and um, 
Well, in particular, it's diagonal, but actually what, it, uh, what, what is already uh, sufficient is that it, it, all of these matrices here, they are random, random diagonal matrices, all of them commute. And that by definition is what we call a critical energy. Right? So a critical energy for any kind of a family, a random family uh, of um, SL2R matrices. So sigma is the random parameter and E is the energy parameter in, in which it should be at least somehow smooth, yeah? So such a critical energy is present whenever all these matrices uh, at that energy, all the random matrices commute. No? And I'll say a little bit more when these random energy, uh, these critical energies appear, they don't only appear in this type of a model here, but they appear in many other situations. But in this present situation here in the random hopping model, it uh, has a supplementary uh, property Namely, the two the matrices here, they are hyperbolic in the sense that they have spectrum of the unit circle. Right? So um, that's why, well, of the unit circle uh, is, is what we call hyperbolic. Right? So that means that uh, they have increasing and decreasing directions, yeah, depending on whether the coefficient up here is larger than one or uh, smaller than one. Okay. Good. Now these two, these these uh, matrices um, will act on so-called prefer variables. Um, so prefer variables often are called so-called prefer angles, but here the prefer variables will be actually real numbers. So we take a lift of the angles, so to say. Yeah? And uh, the action is defined by simply taking these transfer matrices, letting them act on uh, a vector going in the direction of the angle in R2, yes, and uh, then renormalizing so that you get a unit vector back. So that's what's written out here. And uh, well, that definitely gives you again a new um, uh, vector of unit length and which has a new angle. And then the nth angle is defined by, well, letting the nth transfer matrix act on the n minus first thing. Huh? So this is just on uh, an action on projective space, actually, also, if you or lift up that. So what is important also is that we um, have um, a condition um, on the uh, difference between two of these proof of variables uh, spelled out here, which tells you which uh, branch we actually take. So then typically what happens is that these proof of variables, they increase. Actually, one can make quite uh, some general statements also about that. This is a good way to, chix, to, to, fix the, uh, to fix the branch, I should say. And if all these TNs here are um, IID, well, that was our situation, then the, uh, you obtain a Markov process of proof of variables, so a sequence of, uh, of real numbers, yeah? Um, and it's obviously a Markov pr process induced by this uh, SL2R action. It still depends on epsilon, yeah? so on the energy uh, distance to the critical energy. Uh, and that's actually what we want to analyze. How does this uh, Markov process or this random dynamical system depend on epsilon? So once you have that, there's a very nice uh, technique called the oscillation theory or the rotation number calculation, which allows you to access the density of states. This is basically what you know from sturm liouville theory, that the number of oscillations of a solution uh, tells you how many eigenvalues there are below that, uh, that energy at which you compute the solution. Huh? So here, for these, uh, using the formulas, and as I set it up here, you just take the uh, prefer uh, variable, its expectation, you divide by two, two pi. Well, the two comes from the fact that we had polymers, the one over pi is there as well. You divide by n and you take the limit, the limit exists. It actually would exist even almost surely without the expectation, and it gives you the um, integrated density of states. So that's one way to access it. And actually for numerics, this is a very good way to compute it if you more over telescope, namely you uh, telescope this theta n into the contributions 
that you get at each step and you add them up and have, you have a Birkhoff sum and that thing here commu uh, converges extremely nicely on a computer. That's why we get so nice and clean curves for density of states. The second thing that you can do with these proof of variables is that you can look at the Lyapunov exponent. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but here you see uh, you, you have the action uh, of the transfer matrices on these uh, Markov process of angles. And uh, when you take a suitable function, then the expectation of the logarithm of the norm, you get a and you take the Birkhoff sum, you get the Lyapunov exponents out of this. Okay, so this is a little bit the setup. So let's look closer what happens uh, at hyperbolic, uh, at these hyperbolic critical uh, energies. So uh, for that, we go simply directly to the critical energy. So let's, that was energy zero uh, in the particular case uh, of the random hopping model. So the transfer matrices were just had, then just have these diagonal terms. Let's call these diagonal terms kappa n. Uh, so these are these quotients here. As I said, one is the inverse of the other. So this action on unit vectors has two fixed points. Um, so the ones which are at, uh, at k pi and the ones which are at k pi plus a shift of pi half. No? So these are the two unit vectors. Uh, which are fixed point of this action. Well, what does that mean? That means that in particular, the dynamics is going to leave every interval between, uh, well, uh, in half integer pi and an integer pi invariant. So it, if you just take one action, it would just lead to uh, a motion to the, from the left-hand side to the right fixed point, yeah, or inversely. But if you have now random uh, coefficients kappa n, they have actions to the left and to the right, but they never uh, leave any of these intervals. So that's why there would be no rotation, meaning that the um, proof of variables would stay within one interval. They would uh, never go to the next one huh? because, well, you, you, just can't, uh, you just can't make a full turn. However, there is the epsilon term, the energy dependent term. Uh, down here, I spelled it out. Well, it has a particular form, which is not that important. But what is important is that one can check that these epsilon dependent terms induce a small rotation. So this matrix here lies in the Lie algebra of the rotations. Yeah? And uh, it always goes in the, the, in the same direction. So at all of these um, fixed points, uh, the action of the um, zeroth order transfer matrices becomes uh, subdominant. It's of order one, while these contributions are of order epsilon, but close the, to the fixed point, there's this, this, uh, this part here basically has no action. And therefore, at the, close to the fixed point, the action of the energy dependent part becomes dominant. And as I said, it only leads to jumps to one direction, to the right if epsilon is positive, and to the left, if epsilon would be negative, okay? So uh, what's the picture that one has? One has the picture that inside, so these arrows here, actually, you may forget about them. These are not forget. Let me tell you what they are, actually. These, these arrows indicate in which direction you may have a drift. So if you're in the unbalanced situation, it turns out that some of these fixed points here, every second one is repulsive and every second one is attractive. And then you have a net drift, okay, in expectation to the right or to the left. If you're in the balanced situation, there would be no such um, arrows here uh, because, uh, well, you're, you have just as many jumps to the left as to the right. So that, that's why the action would be balanced there. Now, um, What's the picture now? Well, you have this, this uh, random action here in the inside of these intervals, and then you have uh, these small jumps, which push the motion of the proof of variables over into the next interval. And uh, you cannot be pushed back. So that means that the fixed points there are semi-permeable. And um, once you have crossed over, you actually start over with this, sort of the same process as, as you had before. Well, in the unbalanced case, there are two different processes here. But in the balanced case, it's essentially the same process. 
So therefore you start a new and that's something that you can deal with in renewal theory. So let me tell you how this rough idea of or rough understanding of dynamics can be put into a, into a proof now. And uh, that will also explain, allow to explain at least heuristically why you get this logarithm there. So the good thing to do is to pass from the proof of variables to so-called Dyson-Schmidt variables. So these are the cotangents of the thetas. So what they do, they are real numbers and uh, this minus sign is done such that everything is orientation pre uh, preserving. And um, what they do is they build, they, they map an interval, they, they map two of these intervals on one real line. And actually uh, we know that the full real line, uh, well, has consists of two parts, which are separately uh, invariant under the free dynamics without energy perturbation. And therefore it's good to focus on just one half line, let's say on the half line from zero to infinity. And then on that half line, well, you blow it up again by looking at the logarithm of the Dyson-Schmidt variables. And then that's interesting because looking explicitly at the dynamics for epsilon equal to zero, you see that this logarithm of Dyson-Schmidt variables is just a random walk with kicks, which are given by the logarithm of these kappa n's. And it's a balanced random walk if the expectation vanishes, okay? And uh, well, it's, that's, that's the thing that we have to analyze. Actually, we have to analyze this random walk not on the full half line, because going back once again, uh, we know that when we go very close to the left boundary here and to the right boundary, the uh, perturbation becomes effective and dominates in particular the action of the diagonal part, okay? So effectively, what one has to deal with is a random walk of this type, which is on, has, has a hard wall at minus logarithm of one over epsilon. Uh, well, it should be actually logarithm, yeah, no, minus one logarithm of one over epsilon, very in the negative. And it's sufficient to arrive at, at, at logarithm of one over epsilon, which is a positive number. So very far out there to the positive side. So what does that mean? I have, on a, I have to move on a scale of log one over epsilon basically uh, by a usual random walk. So just thinking of the central limit theorem, roughly I should need logarithm of epsilon squared time steps uh, to cross the uh, one of these intervals. And that's basically the, the behavior that we see in the proof. So there's a little problem here on the technical side because uh, when, you, when you cross from the left to the right, there's still some dependence on what was before. So you sort of have to decouple the whole process in order to have something here on the, on the next interval, which is independent of the history before. And for that, what we do is we construct comparison martingales. And uh, well, that's a bit technical, but it's important to, to do that. And for these comparison martingales, a good time to compute the stopping times is then to work with the optimal stopping theorem. And uh, that gives you a good estimate of the so-called uh, inter-arrival times, so the arrival times at these uh, fixed points of the unperturbed dy dynamics. Of course, the technical thing is to control all the error terms in epsilon that becomes quite uh, complicated on an analytic level, but it's, uh, it's feasible and it's what we do. Okay, and then at the end, as I already said, you just, uh, okay, the, the elementary renewal theorem uh, tells you that if you want to compute the full rotation number, you just have to take one over the expectation time of the inter-arrival times, which are all identically distributed if you're in the balanced random walk, but in the unbalanced uh, situation, you have a drift to the left and to the right, as I explained, then, uh, okay, you actually have, uh, uh, th that modifies the dynamics a bit, and uh, you basically argue it by the same strategy, uh, but uh, it turns out that there, uh, you are in uh, a large deviation regime for the crossing, in particular in the situation where you go against the drift 
and uh, that requires a little bit different analysis. Okay, so this was uh, the technical explanation. And now um, I want to tell you why these simple model and uh, these results are of interest in connection with um, interesting physics, I think. So for that, let's look at what we call the uh, SSH model. Um, it's the Su Schrieffer Heger model, which was also actually invented in order to describe polyacetylene um, a long time ago when there was no, no topological materials known, but it turns out that this is the uh, prototype of a topological one-dimensional model. And uh, it can be written again as uh, a Jacobi matrix. So you see here there are um, there are hopping terms T and there's potential terms in the diagonal. However, it's a hopping matrix which um, has matrix degrees of phi, uh, matrix degrees in the fibers. So each of these phi n's here is uh, a vector of uh, well a two l dimensional space. Why 2L? Well, because even dimension is important. What we want is we want that these models again have uh, what we call a chiral symmetry, namely the Hamiltonian is mapped to its inverse under a sym symmetry application. So the symmetry application is the same as before, flips uh, depends on the sides, but moreover it has a flip inside of the matrix degrees uh, of freedom. So that means that also this matrix Vn here in the middle is an off diagonal matrix. Uh, and the crucial hypothesis which makes this model or allows this model to fall into the uh, situation that we had before, the strictly one-dimensional situation, is that these Tn's here have a rank which is equal to one. So let's say it's given by just some random number, a random hopping number as before, and then it connects the last side of the prior one to the first side of the second, uh, of, of the neighboring side. Well, so these would be the TNs, these rank one operators. So there's, so to say, cavities in the middle in which you describe everything by this VN here. And then the cavities are connected, by, but in such a way that the chiral symmetry is respected. Now, it's a good thing to go over to um, reduced transfer matrices to describe that. So that means that we look at the greens function on just the cavity at the end side. Look at the Green's function restricted to the neighboring side. So that gives you a two by two matrix here. Uh, on the, to, the, to the sides, the neighboring side, I mean the sides which are connected to the outside. Yeah? So that gives you uh, four numbers here. With these four numbers, you can spell out um, the reduced transfer matrix. So that's it here. Looks a bit complicated. Um, but if you think a bit about it, it's some sort of a sure complement formula. And um, the TNs, of course, also go into uh, the matrix. And the important thing is, first of all, that even though it looks complicated, it has again, uh, it is again a real matrix. Uh, it's an SL2R, has unit determinant. And the second important thing, which is now connected to the model, is that these uh, that, that it is um, at energy E equal to zero, again, diagonal. So the diagonal term, this kappa N, as before was just the quotient of two neighboring hopping sites. It's here given by, well, the TN and one of these entries, namely the off diagonal entry here at energy E equal to zero. And okay. the off diagonal entries here may disappear, yeah. yes? Yeah, what is the relation between lowercase TN and this matrix TN? Oh, ah, so yeah, for every yeah. site, oh. you uh -huh. it's it's like before you go. Uh, so the defining equation is more or less yeah. something like this. Yeah, mm -hmm. you go mm -hmm. from one side to the next side on your discrete lattice. Okay, yeah. But yeah now yeah, over yeah. each side yeah. of the lattice, you have matrix mm. degrees of freedom, and you somehow mm -hmm. want to integrate them out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's uh, what's I done here. I, yeah. mm -hmm. And. And okay, I didn't spell out the energy modification, but it's actually analytic in E, and uh, you can verify similar properties as before yeah, for yeah. the energy I'm sorry, dependence. Sorry. So it's yeah, actually, I missed I missed one line in this hypothesis. So this lowercase t n is a real number. Yes, and and you compose this matrix t n like this. Okay, yeah, thank you. 
Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I there's, missed that. Unfortunately, yeah. there are two TNs. Huh? There's these TNs, which are the hopping elements here, which is Roman oh. letter. And then there's the uh, yeah, allographic yeah, yeah. T, mm -hmm. which are the mm -hmm. transfer matrices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And moreover, yeah, there's the small T. So sorry mm -hmm. about that. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. But once you've done that, you see if now you have a random model, you're exactly in the same situation as before, namely the transfer matrices at energy zero, which in these models here is the critical energy and the interesting energy uh, is, uh, is a hyperbolic critical energy. Uh, the transfer matrices are diagonal and are hyperbolic. Okay, so let me give you just a short slide about background on this random SSH model. As I already said, it's a prototype of a 1D chiral topological insulator, even though it was not designed for that. The randomness can be chosen kind of arbitrarily, but let's to fix ideas, say it's the TNs just fluctuating numbers a little bit and the VNs, as I said, they are off diagonal matrices. And uh, it's important to have some mass term here to drive it into the uh, topological phase. What usually happens is that in these models, at least in these models, at least if the disorder is sufficiently large, the Fermi gap, uh, the the Fermi level lies inside uh, of the spectrum. So there's no, uh, it's not an insulator in the sense that there's no, there are no states, but there are localized states at the uh, at the Fermi level, at the Fermi level being the critical energy zero. Okay. So what's topological about that? Well. Uh, in this model, you have a non-commutative winding number. Namely, if you compute this object here, you have the Hamiltonian, you commute it with the position operators on the lattice, you multiply it by the inverse, and you multiply it by J, and you take an expectation with respect to a suitable state, namely at the state zero, and you take trace out. This object here is an integer number, okay? And it allows you to distinguish uh, well, the topologically trivial from non-trivial uh, models. And uh, as you turn now on the parameter, say on this mu here and the lambda there, you realize that there are some points at which the uh, winding number here changes. And uh, well, these are changes of the topological phase, and therefore, well, let's call them phase transition. I know many people think that's not a good term because not statistical mechanics in the proper sense, but it's some term that is widely used in the physics community, at least. And Mondragon Shen and uh, his colleagues have plotted a phase diagram for uh, a particular example of these models. You can nicely see what happens there. So, as I already said, the model is sort of localized, and isn't localized, away from the critical energies. And there's actually recently some proofs by Jacob Shapiro of that. He also covers a case where he also covers the localization as, at critical energies. If you spell it out in my terms, actually at critical energies, which are um, not um, balanced. OK, so why is this model interest? Interesting, as last comment on that, there's about boundary correspondence, namely, if you take half space restrictions of this SSH model, uh, this bulk winding number here will tell you how many zero modes you will find on the surfaces, which is just the surface is just where you cut it off of these uh, materials. So these are states which are similar to Majorana modes, even though there's these are no BDG models here, but it's very similar. And these states actually do persist even when the Fermi level, um, when there are many states, bulk states also at the Fermi level. You can always pin down these states which are at the boundary. So that was proved by Jean Michele and Jacob. Okay, so now let's connect with the first part of the talk. Um, I said, uh, well, I said there's this phase boundary. So how do we define the phase boundary? Well, the phase boundary can be defined by saying it's all those energies um, where the um, where you are have a balanced model. So the balanced model means that the Lyapunov exponent as these at zero energy in these models actually um, vanishes. Huh? So this is what's spelled out here. You look at all parameters lambda mu, which were the two parameters in the disorder space, yeah, 
moving the disorder strength of the hopping part and of the diagonal part. You go to those particular points on the phase boundary where you know that the expectation of the logarithm is zero, okay? That's the Lyapunov exponent, actually. If that Lyapunov exponent vanishes, we say we are on the phase boundary. And uh, if you now spell out the properties of the theorem uh, that I stated before for the hopping model, the hopping model is just such a tra phase transition point. On these phase transition points, we do have a logarithmic divergence of the density of states. And a second point is, well, off the uh, phase transition, there is a pseudo gap in these SSH models, okay, or generalized SSH models. Okay, so if you look at this from that perspective, there's actually quite a few interesting questions that we are trying to address right now, um, which are quite natural. So one of the things which is known that when you go through such a phase boundary, uh, so you have, and, and you do have a change of the topological uh, invariant, which is the winding number here, we do know that there is no Anderson localization. No, actually in the sense of um, eisenmann molchanov there is no localization at this, uh, at the uh, critical energy, okay? So the question is, can we somehow get a more quantitative estimate about that? Uh, is it possible to prove a quantitative lower bound on the transport? Is the quantum motion at these phase transition bounds uh, diffusive? That's what we actually believe. Uh, we already know it's going to be, uh, a multi-scale phenomenon. So depending on which moments of the position operator you actually measure, you're going to get different exponents, but uh, it, it looks like it's going to be dis diffusive. And uh, let me ex explain how that comes about. So there's, there's many states close to the, uh, close to the uh, critical energy because of the logarithmic di divergence. I go once again to the slide here. There's many such states which are there. The Lyapunov exponent um, grows very fast. So the inverse localization length uh, diverges not so fast. So it's possible that these states which have large inverse, uh, large localization lengths, yeah, carry most of the transport. And there are many such states. So you have to weigh between these two phenomena by and, and that can be done actually mathematically as well and has been done before in in what we call this uh, random uh, polymer model in the work with Lana and uh, Günther and by following the same strategy we hope that we can prove these quantitative lower bounds on the transport now uh, what you need to know for that is very good information also about the Lyapunov exponent for well, now I only proved we only proved something about the density of states to access the Lyapunov exponent and uh, see what the um, yeah uh, what the correct behavior is. You need a very good understanding of the Furstenberg measure actually, and that we also didn't access yet. And further questions are: What are the level statistics? Uh, do you have sort of like metallic behavior there, or is it uh, a random behavior? Or is it maybe even a new one? We don't know. And another thing is one could look at uh, the, the area law, or the enhanced with A area law as, as uh, in the work by Müller, Pasteur, and Schulte, okay? Which basically use similar techniques as, in, as I've explained now, but for elliptic critical energies. So this would be the first part of my talk. Um, are there any questions right now? Because I would then, or the, the second, First and second part of my talk, I would then, if there's no questions, go to the, the next slides where it goes about elliptic energies. I don't see questions. Oh, maybe oh, okay. there's one, can, can sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Question. So, yeah, in, this, in this phase boundary point, so is winding number ill defined? So how does it yes, jump? Yes, it's not, it's not defined okay. exactly. Okay. You, there's, oh. uh, makes no sense. Okay, so like, there is some condition for this index to be well defined that that's you right. didn't mention. That's right, and it's uh, mm -hmm. it's violated in these points. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Maybe I could say, I mean, we had uh, a recent uh, work with uh, Tom Stoiber, which gives mm -hmm. very, very general conditions uh, when these index uh, indices are well defined. Uh, 
which do cover the Anderson localization regime, but it even covers other situations like uh, semi-metals and so, but this situation mm -hmm. here is not covered. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so other questions? Well, then let's go into the uh, world of elliptic critical energies. Um, well, it's critical energy. So again, these things, I mean, the transfer matrices all commute. Uh, it's not hyperbolic. The spectrum now will lie on the unit circle. So an elliptic critical energy is defined by the fact that the spectrum of all of these transfer matrices, yeah, almost surely at least, lies on the unit circle. And uh, actually uh, is, uh, is not a Jordan block. I forgot to spell that out because if you do have a Jordan block, uh, then we have um, uh, we have parabolic uh, parabolic uh, critical point. Okay, so at an elliptic critical points, it's possible that all of these transfer matrices can simultaneously be diagonalized with one matrix into a random rotation, uh, two by two rotation matrix. Simply, so these energies, these elliptic critical energies, appear in a model that I don't explain in detail, a random polymer model. Uh, which was uh, a cousin of what is in the physics community called the random dimer model, but it has nothing to do with the random hopping dimers. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit different. Anyway, it's a well-studied model. And um, it also appears in the prototypical one-dimensional Anderson model. Um, if instead of the energy parameter, you take the parameter of the coupling of the disorder. So if you take this lambda, so this, the Anderson model would be Laplacian plus a coupled disordered potential. If you take this lambda as the parameter, you also have uh, this kind of a situation because then the transfer matrix at lambda equal to zero actually would be given by just one matrix. And as long as you're inside of the spectrum of the Laplacian, this one matrix would be elliptic. So there's one further hypothesis. We will suppose that um, all these rotation angles here they are not all either zero or pi over two because these are particular energies. They are called anomalies were introduced by Wigner and uh, Kapos. And uh, well, let's just suppose we're not on this very exceptional points for the moment being. And uh, well, parabolic and uh, critical points appear also if you look at the base, uh, at the spectral boundaries of the Anderson model, or if you look in a random chronic bonding metal, for, for example. So they also have the interest, but I'm not going to say anything about them. So what do you do first? Well, you have, again, the proof of phase dynamics um, on projective space in R2. And now, so we go over to the phases. And the most important quantity in this business is then the invariant measure, which is called the Furstenberg measure of this process. Uh, it's defined by this invariance equation here. And typically, one knows that it's unique, okay? Under very weak hypothesis, it's, uh, it's unique. And the, a well-known theorem, which at least goes back to the book of Pasteur of Figotin, but actually was in the physics community before, is that uh, if, if one is away from an anomaly and one has such a critical energy, then the... Furstenberg measure is to lowest order in a weak sense given by the Lebesgue measure. So if you integrate over the Furstenberg measure, any function on the unit circle, well, it's given by the integration over the Lebesgue measure up to arrows, which are of second order in epsilon only. Okay, so there's no first order in epsilon. It's not supposed uh, that, it, that there's, there's something centered here. Um, well, there really has to be, you really have to do some, some proof there. And uh, moreover, what will be important in the, in the following is that you can compute the Lyapunov exponents and the Lyapunov exponents, they behave quadratically with the coefficient D, which can be computed and is positive. Uh, so you have a quadratic growth uh, of the Lyapunov exponent. Of course, if epsilon is equal to zero at, a critical, at an elliptic critical energies, you only have rotations. These rotations, they all commute, so there's no growth. So the Lyapunov exponent will be vanishing at those. So what my uh, last slides will be about uh, is to add a complex part of the energy to uh, a complex imaginary part to the energy. 
So that's of importance for study of quantum transport, for example. So we replace the energy by, well, the critical energy plus a real part in energy epsilon plus I delta. And this I delta is typically one over time, then, yeah, if you look at quantum transport. So you have a two parameter family of such matrices, which are now in SL2C, but we can have a dynamics on proofer variables just as before. Actually, we just look at the proofer phases. So these are, this is actually uh, a map for a, a, a chart for the complex projective space of dimension one. And it's convenient to look at these complex projective space under stereographic projection, which, well, maps unit vectors, complex unit vectors onto numbers, which in general would be in the complex plane, but because here this delta is positive, uh, will be such that the dynamics leaves the unit disk invariant. So, um, the random dynamics generated with the positive imaginary part here leaves the unit, unit disk invariant. And it's just the dynamics is in this representation under the stereographic projection just given by Möbius transformations with the transfer matrix. Right? So it's very simple. What one still has, so this Möbius action is denoted by a dot here simply. Yeah. So what one still has, one has this Furstenberg measure, but now the Furstenberg measure depends on two parameters. So there's the energy, the real energy, epsilon, and there's the complex contribution, delta. Defined by the same equation, but it's now an equation for functions, continuous functions on the closed unit disk, okay? And we are interested in the regime of small epsilon and uh, small delta. And actually the interesting thing is that there's a crossover regime in this whole story. Uh, when epsilon square is of the same order as delta. So what do you mean by that? Well, let's first do some uh, numerics and then I'll state a theorem for you as, again. So um, what we do as numerics is we have this unit disk where these um, variables Z play in. You generate a random orbit here compu concretely computed with the transfer matrices of the Anderson model at complex energy and you let it run. And well, if epsilon is the disorder strength, uh, 10 to the power minus four and delta is 10 to the power minus three, such that epsilon is much smaller than delta. Uh, actually I should have written, yeah, epsilon, what was it? Epsilon square is much smaller than, uh, than delta. Um, then you get this kind of a plot. So what I did is I started out somewhere around here by Z equal to one, I guess. And then the orbit circulates around and moves towards the inside. And once it gets to the inside, it stays there. Uh, so actually this whole interesting uh, plot there is only due to the initial uh, points. Uh, in the long run, the distribution will be completely centered at the, zero, at the center of the disk. Yeah? And actually what we can prove afterwards is this the Furstenberg measure is supported on a ball of size of order delta around the center. So if you go to the other regime, um, everything is the same. Now epsilon square is much larger than delta. So what you see is um, here, I started also with the point here and on the, at z, equal, at, at, at z uh, zero is equal to one. You see that the, orbit seems to stick to the boundary. There's no reason why it should do that. And namely, one can always construct orbits which array, arrive here in the center. It's just very, very unlikely. So there is a drift to the outside. And actually this drift to the outside is due to the positive Lyapunov exponent in this regime. You get a nice plot also for the distribution of Z square uh, as before here. I also had this his histogram of the values Z N square. Uh, well, and it's on the outside. Huh? So this is only the radius. There's also this rotational symmetry. Well, this rotational symmetry is a reminiscent of this phase trend of this um, no, phase, um, what was it called? Phase property, yeah? Random phase approximation. Okay, good. So now um, that's actually not easy to understand. 
what it also means is that if delta goes to zero, um, I take out the imaginary part, the orbit is going to stick farther and further to the outside. So you actually converge to a Furstenberg measure, which in the limit will then be concentrated just on the unit circle outside in the boundary. So that fits nicely together, but you have to understand why it does that. And here's the intermediate regime. Now, epsilon and delta are such that epsilon square is of the order of delta. Um, well, then we, it's interesting to look at this parameter lambda, which is, well, the quotient of delta and epsilon square. And there's also this coefficient d uh, determining the Lyapunov exponent. And you see there's for three different values of this couple here, there's graphs, sorry. There's graphs here, well, numerical plots, and there is a curve, a blue line there. The blue line is given by this distribution here. Well, that's what actually just comes out. Um, you see that the radi we seem to be able to compute the radial distribution very nicely here. Huh? It's still rotation invariant, but if you now would plot for these values something like here, there would be a ring uh, well, there would be a, a distribution which would fill up the full unit disk. You would see some areas where it's more likely and others less likely, but uh, well, as determined by these curves here. Yeah? So I'll try to explain you in the last couple of minutes where this uh, function here comes from, but uh, let me first state the theorem, which uh, roughly says that we can prove that these three behaviors are uh, actually uh, uh, present also, I mean, can, can, be, can, be, can be proved. The first is where delta is much larger than epsilon squared. Well, there we stick to the origin. Uh, that means that if you look at the, the um, Furstenberg measure and you, well, measure the z square, you get something which is very small. So you're close to the origin. Whereas if delta is very small, so the imaginary part of the energy is very small, you actually stick to the outside. Well, that's uh, what's written here. Uh, so Z is almost one up to errors, which are of this size, which we can, as we can prove here. And in the intermediate regime, well, in terms of this parameter lambda and the function rho lambda that I just spelled out, you can compute actually the uh, expectation value. So we have a weak formula for the um, Furstenberg measure um, up to, Errors. So I think this is mathematically nice, um, a nice result to access these non trivial distributions. But let me also say that it's kind of useful to have this information. So, in particular, uh, if you apply this in the random polymer model, you can immediately, by just using some kind of Jensen equality, uh, deduce lower bounds on the dynamics and therefore avoid large technical difficulties that there were in my work with Lana and Günther some time ago. So I think it's good, it's, it's valuable, interesting information that you get out of theorems like that. So I see my time is almost over, but let me uh, go in, in just a minute over the idea how to prove the statement down here. I mean, the first one is basically hyperbolicity estimates. The second here is basically like rotation number computations and like uh, the uh, phase approximation um, rotation the phase uh, approximation property, uh, but going to second order, it's complicated as well. But let, let me indicate how you get this rho uh, lambda. Why, where do we get this explicit function from? So what we do is you first write, rewrite the invariance equation, um, the expectation value for some function, then using the invariance equation, you re rewrite it several times, you get a Birkhoff sum, and then you try to control these Birkhoff sums of smooth function by going back in history one step. And if you do that, uh, well, you will need to expand the function G here into, um, into a, a series, yeah, actually a Taylor series. It gives you first order terms. Here is written G prime times something which is of order delta. And then there are terms, well, which I didn't spell out because it's a long formula, but you have to go to order epsilon and epsilon squared also, which involves derivatives uh, of first and second order of G. And then you see the terms, these two terms here, well, they are almost the same. They're just shifted. So in the limit n going to infinity, they will just cancel out and you will get something which involves 
Birkhoff sums of first order and second order of G, which uh, will vanish then up to arrows. And if you spell that out a little bit, what you find is that expectation values, which are in the image of some differential operator, um, are going to be small. So the differential operator can be computed. Uh, here, it's, here it's spelled out. Um, there appears the coefficient lambda in there. Well, that comes from a lot of algebra, but it, it's there. And then you just have to do in the end, you have to do functional analysis of these first order operators on the interval of uh, Z squares going from zero to one. And um, well, uh, not going into detail, but these two operators, they are singular elliptic operators, but they nevertheless have a kernel, which is one dimensional. I mean, I mean the adjoint and the operator have a one dimensional kernel and the kernel of the adjoint is actually this function rho lambda. Okay, so you, it's the sol solution of the adjoint of this equation here, the fundamental of that solution, of that uh, operator. Okay, maybe I gave you just rough idea how to do that. I think the other things are not so important. And uh, let me conclude by just putting up the first slide once again. So I think I told you a little bit what these random hopping models are, that there's these hyperbolic critical energies, that there's quite a lot of probability theory going into proving actually estimates for the density of states. This is of relevance for physical, for these um, um, topological phase transitions. Um, and there's other critical energies. There's the elliptic ones, which I explained a little bit what they are, but they're also parabolic ones. And uh, it's, it's an in, something which, uh, well, is quite elementary, of course, but I think is of uh, some physical interest uh, because the outcomes are somewhat surprising, at least for us. Even in this random mod hopping model, to find uh, these uh, divergences was uh, sort of a surprise. I mean, no, we understand much better, but uh, that, that was kind of a fun project for that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herman, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I now leave uh, the floor to the audience for questions or comments. Uh, actually, I have one. I would like to start with one. So, so when you mention lower bound on transport, what would you? What is the quantity that you want to bound from below? In fact, I think I missed that part. So, how would so, you quantify so, transport there? Yeah. So usually, what you do is you take the position operator and you let it evolve with the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or say okay. you take the square of the position operator. So you take x square times e to the power i h t and uh, I see, so I see. The adjoint to the i, and then you take expectation values. And what you realize that, okay, if you take at least, if you take a time average of that, you get a quantity which is uh, closely related to the Green's functions imaginary energy and mm -hmm. imaginary energies. Yeah. And then you have to bound uh, these, uh, these okay. uh, quantities. And the Green's functions, again, well, they satisfy the transfer matrix equations, and therefore you have a handle on, uh, on accessing that. I see, I see. Yeah. And, and what I meant with multi-scaling is that the interesting thing is if you take x square or you say in, instead of x square, you take x to the power q, depending mm -hmm. on which q you take, q being a number from zero to infinity, say, you will get different growth exponents, okay? They don't only depend trivially on q. Trivial would be it's linear in q and always has the same coefficient, but no, there's some dependence on q and that indicates that there's very small parts of the wave packet which grow, which which move much faster than others. Uh -huh, okay. And you pick I those see. up uh, with higher yeah. and higher moments. Okay? I see. I see. I see. Yeah. So there's yeah. multi-scaling. It's a it's a phenomenon that is known also from um, from quasi-periodic systems, for example. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions? Sir? Uh, yes, this is a related question, I think. So you have shown us this trajectory of Zn in this 1D Anderson model, and sometimes it goes like this and sometimes. So uh -huh. how does it, these simulations relate to transport or time dependence or whatever? Um, well, the not directly, I should say. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so if I say you can prove a lower bound, Hmm. Basically, uh, on, on the dynamics in the sense that I just uh, told Marcello, it means that you write out the 
you you write out uh, the formula for the um, moments of the position operator. Yes. And if you yeah. want to bound a lower bound, you see that, okay, mm. you can, first of all, take the expectation value of these moments, yeah? Mm. And then you write out the formula, and uh, then you see that if you um, bound that quantity, it's possible to make precisely this first Berg measure appear, mm. okay? It's a Jensen inequality, as I said, but uh, a little bit of something has to be done. It's not immediate. So, so but then from these results that you presented us, you already have some quantitative information transport. That's right. Uh, we have it for the elliptic, um, for the elliptic uh, critical energies. We have that, but we don't have it at these phase transition points. You see, at the elliptic critical energies. The Lyapunov exponent uh, is behaves quadratically. Mm -hmm. The density of states is completely innocent. Yeah. While here at the hyperbolic critical energies, well, you do have the spike of the density of states, logarithmic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Lyapunov exponent vanishes, but only very steeply. So there are very, very few of these extended states actually, because localization length away from the center grows extremely rapidly. Mm -hmm. I see. So for that, uh, we don't know yet. I mean, we mm -hmm. don't have such a theorem here for hyperbolic critical energies yet. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah. Other let question? Me, ah, sorry. Let me sh unshare the screen so that I see <laughs> if in case somebody asks. Are there other questions from the audience? Uh, maybe I have another one actually. So uh, when you mentioned the critical curve of uh, that was the SSH model, so do you can you actually find that? Uh, I mean, uh, the, we, in terms of this lambda lambda mu parameters, I mean, how explicit is that? Yeah. So there's um, there's very particular situ situ very particular distributions for which you can more or less compute it explicitly. I see. Okay. Uh, but in general, there's no chance, of course, to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. Definition here would be some of the abstract way to approach that. And uh, okay, uh, let's say if you take a Bernoulli distribution or an absolutely continuous distribution, I think you can compute it mm -hmm. because then the Lyapunov exponent can be computed explicitly uh, and you get a function of lambda and mu and you just, uh, okay, it's still an analytic function, but you know this analytic function has a zero set and that's it. Huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I see. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so if there's no other question, I think we can thank again Herman for the very nice talk. Thank you very much, Herman. Well, thank you for listening.